Steve said, he's asked me to speak on the subject of living. And I'm going to offer you three interventions, three provocations, as it were, into this theme. And what I'd like you to do is imagine these three pictures that I'm going to give you. And I'm going to try and paint a picture of them for you. So firstly, I'd like you to imagine a fridge. It's quite a new fridge. It's not one of those fancy American fridges. It's just an ordinary fridge. And it's covered in correspondence. Each letter bears a similar but slightly different pattern. There's a date, a time, and a blue logo with three beautiful letters, N, H, S, inscribed in the top right hand corner. Secondly, I'd like you to imagine an out of town shopping centre. It's built into a giant quarry, and there's a sea of cars, lights shining out over the landscape in the dark. And thirdly, I'd like you to imagine, if you can, a tree made up of names. You can choose any names you like, but make them really wonderful names the kind of names that will make you smile. Now, I want you to hold on to these pictures for me. So when Steve asked me very kindly to come and talk to you about living, it was the little fridge, which is my little fridge, that first came into my mind. I have pictures of the little fridge on my phone if you want to see it later. Much of my life revolves around the correspondence on this little fridge. Each of, the, each of those letters that lives on the fridge invites me to a lovely medical for a variety of annoying chronic health conditions. And each of these is both a pain and a gift. The pain is obvious, the gift less so. What I know, however, is that this fridge, and more specifically its kind of display board function, has made me acutely aware of living, bringing me closer to my own mortality in a way which quite viscerally reminds me of life's precious precariousness. To try and explain this in words is quite difficult, and I'm trying to think about how I might do this, but it's a kind of warm weight in the middle of your chest, if you can think about it like that. Now, there's nothing revelatory in this acknowledgement, this awareness that death makes one acutely conscious of life. A friend of mine who has stage four cancer has spent the past year rejecting everything the doctors have told him about travel and chemotherapy, and he's traveling the world and he's sucking up all of the sensory experiences that come along with this. He's living in ways that he never did his diagnosis. Now to some extent we all are, and here I mean specifically in the West rather than globally, caught in this particular relationship between life and death. Secularity makes death a high stakes event, yet healthcare and living standards allow us to easily slide into our own immortality, imagining the end of life is distant. The contemporary authors I've been reading recently seem to be preoccupied with this tension. Their novels promise the possibility of immortality through magical resurrections or unfinished deaths. We consume them as readers with great veracity as they shore up our own denial of life's finitude. There's the world in carnivalesque of the most recent Booker Prize winner, George Saunders, Lincoln in the Bardo, offering us its graveyard of silence, marginalised subjects, whose voices ultimately triumph over the memory of the book's more likely subject, the young son of Abraham Lincoln. Then there's the deferral of John McGregor's Reservoir 13, a novel of the seasons and their cycles. Each chapter is a year, each chapter returns again to the same landscape, the same community, and the haunting figure of an absent girl, whose disappearance seems to keep her more alive to the community than her presence would have, perhaps. We read on frustrated that the mystery is never solved, but also somehow comforted, happy to remain in a space where death has not been Confirmed, and where we can imagine that the girl lives on forever. Finally, I've been reading the work of Ali Smith, who's always been concerned with magical resurrections, bringing the dead to life in novels like Hotel World, How to Be Both, and Girl Meets Boy. Smith's ghosts are frequently radical interpreters of the present, shape shifting, gender defying voices whose existence after death is often the least dramatic of their transformations. As Smith said in the Goldsmith lecture at the end of the last month, the novel matters because life is terrifying. These voices comfort us by offering us the secular equivalent of religious discourse, the promise of life everlasting, keeping the harsh essence of atheism at bay with fabulous reinvention. As such, they mirror more explicitly the function of writing in general as a memorialising of experiences that push it against death through the promise that, at least on the page, one can live forever. They also speak to how we might actively grasp living within the midst of the chaos of the contemporary. Smith's work, if 
you know, Ilnaya draws heavily from modernist style. And like the original modernist, she's concerned with everyday secular epiphanies. Remember the second of my opening scenes? The shopping mall, the quarry? Well, this is one such moment. I remember standing in the parking lot of the Blue Water shopping mall, of all the places, about 10 years ago, and being struck by this kind of 20th century Egyptian pyramid gesturing towards the sublime of intelligent design in its unnaturalness. Standing so small within the context of something human made and so vast and so frankly pompous offered a feeling of transcendence. What fiction like Smith's attempts to do is give us a series of these kind of shopping mall moments in meditations on soap powder and motorway fine art records and supermarkets. And when I get the chance to do some creative writing, which isn't very often, but I do love to do it, I'm fascinated by these kinds of encounters. The possibility to call resonances and intensities out of the everyday, and to relish the sense of the spectacular ordinary. The issue of how to draw meaning from life carries a particular resonance in the contemporary moment. This is not to say that in early centuries writers were not grappling for meaning, but rather that the context of that meaning was profoundly different. When Albert Einstein reflected on the meaning of life, he did so in the following words. He said, I once thought that if I could ask God one question, I would ask how the universe began, because once I knew that, all the rest is simply equations. But as I got older, I became less concerned with how the universe began. Rather, I would want to know why he started the universe. For once I knew that answer, then I would know the purpose. In the context of his belief in a transcendental, transcendent force, Einstein assumed there was a purpose of living, which it was his quest to somehow uncover. This is quite different from the contemporary desire to define one's purpose and to create meaning rather than discover its pre-existence. There is huge liberty for the writer in this shift, offering an expansive range of possibilities unheeded by moral or social absolutes. And there is also the exciting challenge of attempting to capture this less well-defined nature of life. Our media suggests we are consumed by this endeavour with varying levels of awareness of the privilege such inquiries represent. And it's here that we reach that final scene. So earlier this year, I began researching my family tree. As I sit trying to plot out my complex family history, I'm attempting, like those contemporary writers I have been reading, to bring the dead back to life. Now, I don't know what names you chose, but in my family tree, I resurrected Bathsheba, and Minnie, and Nutty, and Happy. In fact, I resurrected two Bathshebas and two Happies. So, in doing so, I also uncovered a way of living vastly different to my own. My grandfather was the youngest of 11 children. His mother, an illegitimate servant who probably never knew either of them, had her first child at the age of 20, and she had my grandfather at the age of 45. His father was one of 15, and at least three of those children died in the first year of life. I wonder how this must have shaped their understanding of living, its values and its struggles. I wonder how much time my ancestors had for the privilege of reflection, their questioning coming within the context of a much more pressing awareness of the contingency of that life and struggle to maintain it. But this struggle too, ironically, perhaps came a certain kind of forgetting. Scanning newspapers today, one finds a plethora of life stories, stories often devoted to a lifetime of mourning, a singular event. The loss of a child or the death of someone in their supposed prime has become in the contemporary West an exceptional event. For those in my family tree, there would have been an impossible level of mourning to have taken place should they have lived as we mostly do in the West today. A repetition of losses that still happens across the world where privilege is less widespread. And here too, we mustn't forget, in the lives of those who are denied it through poverty and prejudice, but which rarely touches us personally. Despite our past freedoms, we are perhaps more than ever caught in living through our pasts. The irony of liberation from struggle, spawning more tenacious kind of internal in his most recent novel, the now Nobel Prize winning Kazuo Ishiguro writes a powerful parable concerning this question. The buried giant is the story of an old couple setting out on a journey to find their son. 
They live in a world in which memory no longer exists, somehow supposedly obliterated by the presence of a dragon. They remember nothing of where their son was born or of their own history together. All that remains are vague shadows. Their quest during the novel reflects upon their desire to see the dragon's demise and for their memories to be returned. They declare stridently that their relationship can survive whatever is uncovered, whatever the past reveals. Yet when this happens, the implication is otherwise. We find that their son has died, and the novel ends with their parting, the old man walking away as his wife departs for the afterlife. In many ways, the hard, basic lives of the old couple filled with loss has only been possible because of a lack of remembrance. In this way, Shibiru draws attention to the privilege of our contemporary moment in which our ability to relish our pasts and reflect on them is only possible with the present that allows this indulgence. But equally, Ishiguro asks us through the parable to consider what it means to truly live. How, Ishiguro asks, is our living impeded by our fascination with remembrance? How do we remember what is important so as to move forward and not repeat the mistakes of the past, without becoming trapped in the history we aim to avoid? How is our engagement with the present, and in particular our capacity to love, shaped by our living not in the moment, but in what has gone. Smith, too, in her own way, seems to be offering us these questions in her most recent novel, Autumn, which didn't win the Booker Prize in itself. Such a wonderful bundle of sizzling joy, I think you should just go out and read it now. Well, wait, wait for Tom at the end of the talks, but, but soon. Um, after all the resurrections of the dead in her earlier work, Smith's novel of an old man and his friendship with a young girl turns her own nose up around by his head. So an old man awakes on a beach and tells us he's dead. He's definitely dead. But the novel ends with him awake in the hospital room with a young girl beside him, still very much alive. Or at least, I think so. Maybe not. Maybe when you read it, you'll be fine. Explicitly concerned with post-Brexit politics, Smith seems to be telling us to stop our obsessive desire to resurrect the past and, and raise ghosts, and to instead write the kind of stories that will take us towards there is work here to be done amongst the living, she tells us. And life, however bleak the current moment, however bleak its politics, is a privilege to seize.